construction of the curbside pump that uh, gasoline could be transferred to the automobile via a hose. In 1913, the Gulf Corporation built the first drive-in service station in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The brick pagoda-style structure sat on a raised island, flanked by crude hand-cranked pumps. By 1916, 200 oil companies were offering roadside service along the nation's highways. Customers would pump gas by hand while attendants figured out the charges with pen and paper. The 1920s brought the luxury of an electronic device called the Visi Gauge Pump, a tall glass dome dispenser that offered two octane grades of fuel. The addition of pump attendants brought in the era of full service. This pampering allowed the driver to refill his or her tank without leaving the driver's seat. The first true drive through had been born. Marketing tenants of the first gas stations were the same as the drive throughs of today. Towering signage with long distance impact and a recognizable logo. The shopping experience prior to the automobile was really a main street where you would walk down and purvey your uh, goods through a window. With the automobile, all of a sudden you had people going 35 miles an hour down a highway. And how do you get people to stop at your business? Well, certainly one way to do that is signage. So you would have gas stations, you'd have billboards, you would have buildings that start to become signs. The next 40 years saw a rapid fire succession of technical innovation designed to increase speed and convenience. Credit cards, digital displays, and self-service pumps helped raise the gas pump speed limit. Someone once told me that buying gas ranked lower in terms of the consumer preference than having a root canal. I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but why do people put off buying gas? Well, I think because they, they, they've got better things to do. In 1983, the POS, or point of sale system, was introduced by Shell Oil Company. The credit card reader was incorporated into the gas pump itself. Pump, swipe, and go was the slogan. Surely the maximum speed for buying gas had been reached. Not quite. In the 1990s, companies like Transcore and Texas Instruments introduced a technology that would break the cash speed barrier. It was called RFID. RFID is simply a radio frequency identification. Uh, I mean, simply put, it's just like a radio. The RFID, or Smart Pass system, uses a radio sensor to identify a transponder inside the car, or a cell phone. Once the transaction is complete, it is electronically billed to the user's credit card account. Campaigns such as Mobile's Gas and Go also used RFID technology. Texas Instruments worked with ExxonMobil some years ago to apply it to the payment method uh, at, at a gas station. And that's to provide the customer the convenience and the security and the speed of being able to use a, a, an RF uh, ID tag instead of paying by cash or by a traditional credit card. Once our tanks were full of gas, we were free to head for the open road, such as it was. At the turn of the century, most roads in America were leveled beds of packed earth covered with gravel. Wet weather often turned early motoring into an off-road experience. The first paved highway was laid near Detroit in 1908. In 1921, the federal government passed the Federal Highway Act. Ribbons of asphalt and concrete flowed out from the cities and spawned a new kind of living environment called suburbs. Multi-lane interstates spread from coast to coast, and with them came another drive through the toll booth. Toll roads probably date back to the beginnings of commerce. London Bridge had tolls as early as 1286. The concept was simple. Let the users of the road or bridge pay for its construction. Early toll roads were called turnpikes. The name derived from a wooden pole or pike that would block the road until the toll was paid, then turn to allow the traveler to pass. In 1935, the first major American toll road, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, was built connecting Pennsylvania with Ohio and New Jersey. It was a financial and engineering success and spawned imitation across the country. 
The years from 1945 to 1956 saw rapid growth in toll roads and bridges. But soon, the ever-rising numbers of cars began to choke the toll plazas and clog the on-ramps. For instance, the toll is 25 cents and somebody hands over a dollar bill. So you've got to find the change and hand that change over. And literally, when there are at peak travel times, when there are thousands of people, then it all accumulates. One attempt to standardize toll money in the form of tokens helped speed things up somewhat. But still, the lines grew. Some attendants were replaced with catch baskets that used gravity to funnel the coins down into coin counters. But poor aim and incorrect amounts still snarled the lines. Fortunately, in the 1990s, the same technology that had sped up fuel delivery came to the rescue of the beleaguered tolls. RFID, the smart pass. Improvements to the RFID technology now allowed cars to be scanned and billed without even stopping. Drivers could pay their tolls at 50 miles an hour. The number of vehicles moving through the plazas rose from 180 per hour to 720 per hour. Faster and faster, the gas stations fed the cars and the tolls fed the highways. But who was feeding the drivers and passengers? Next, we'll meet the boss hog that brought the car and the meal together. Fast food. Since the birth of the car, an estimated one half of one percent of the American landscape has become paved road. drive through will return on Modern Marvels. By 1920, there were eight million cars on the American highway. Not all of this travel was related to work. The automobile had created a new pastime, motoring, touring, Sunday driving. As it became evident that people enjoyed spending time in their cars, it was only a matter of time before someone reasoned that they might like to eat there, too. Though it is widely assumed that this phenomenon began in California, it actually happened in Texas. In 1921, the first drive-in in the world was open, that was the pig stand. And the idea came from J.G. Kirby, who was a mercantile in Dallas. And um, he approached Dr. Reuben Jackson, who was a prominent physician in Dallas, uh, with the idea of opening up a drive-in restaurant. And the idea was to serve people exclusively in their cars, uh, not have any inside service, have waiters to come out to the car. Dr. Jackson had the capital to fund the project. Well, Mr. Kirby, he was famous for his quote of saying that people with cars are so lazy that they don't want to get out of them to go eat. And that prophecy proved to be very true. Recreational driving had spawned recreational dining. The drive-ins created a kind of roadside theater. The main performers were waiters. They hired young boys to be the waiters, uh, 13, 14 years old. And uh, they developed a game where when they would see the old Model T's turning in to, toward the curb, uh, they would race out and whoever got on that running board of the old Model T, that was their customer. So it became a real competitive thing. And as, that's where the term car hop originated, because they hopped on the running board. The 1930s saw a neon explosion of drive-ins across the sunbelts of Florida, Texas, and California. Signage and architecture became more and more outrageous in its attempt to yank hungry motorists off the highway. So we have this whole phenomena of uh, this kind of California crazy pop architecture phenomena where buildings all of a sudden start to look like the objects that they were selling. So giant ice cream cones would appear. And then it rolled into giant pumpkins and giant pigs and giant dogs. And there was all kinds of business that came through that. The whole idea of advertising, you know, changed uh, with the advent of the car and how you got people into your business. By the 1940s, drive-in restaurant competition was growing fierce. Drive-in owners fought for market share using any gimmick they could think of. One of the first major changes was to add sex appeal. They discovered that women had obviously much more appeal to be doing this kind of activity. So then the owners of some of these restaurants start to costume the car hops in various get-ups. So you might go to one...
restaurant that was themed, say, in uh, Mount Vernon kind of motif. One would come out in hoose skirts, and the other one's just like a man as a butler uh, with this kind of southern uh, antebellum feel to it. Business boomed as the drive-ins reproved the old adage, sex sells. Down in Texas at Civil's drive-in, the owners there put their waitresses in very abbreviated costumes made out of satin and shorts. Uh, immediately there was an uproar by people saying, now you're really gone too far. There was a lot of protest, but it became such a uh, phenomenal life magazine featured one of the car hops on the cover uh, that this now became the standard. So they had these large plumed hats that look uh, like drum majorettes, uh, abbreviated costumes. Having a sexy dame feed you was, uh, was pretty appealing in that 40s period. By the late 1940s, the drive-in concept was beginning to show signs of stress. And there were a lot of problems with drive-ins. They had a lot of theft of plates and silverware, which drove them nuts. They had all of the, uh, the fry cooks fraternizing with the socializing with the car hops. And they oversaturated the market. There was only so much that this niche could carry. So you start to see, you know, the whole structure of this restaurant industry changing in its relationship to the car. Teenagers, in fact, were really one of the major parts of killing off drive-ins. They would play their radios and they would order Coke and French fries because what you had, you know, 15, 20, 30 spaces occupied by a bunch of rowdy teenagers who wouldn't leave. They scared away the family, which was the bread and butter of these drive-in restaurants. The industry needed a new system to remedy the problems and to get family business back into the restaurants. It found the answer in San Bernardino, California. It was the brainchild of a couple of brothers from New England. Their names were Maurice and Richard McDonald. The McDonald brothers had a drive-in, very much like all the other drive-ins that existed in California in the early 40s. It was a unique shape. It was uh, an octagon. But it also had all these car hops. In 1948, the McDonald brothers decided to take a gamble on a completely new concept. They did something that few business operators dream of, of doing. They took a drive-in that was making $100,000 a year for them, net. They totally shut down their restaurant. They took the menu down from 35 items down to 9 items. They got rid of the the car hops, they got rid of the silverware and the flatware. Three months later, they reopened with a restaurant that no one had seen before. No one. This new restaurant was a self-serve drive-in that turned the customers into car hops. It was essentially a walk-up window that promised a limited menu of fresh and tasty, inexpensive food served at extreme speed. Everything was built on speed. And that was a whole different concept. They called this concept their speedy service system. They could turn around an order in as fast as 15 seconds. You could walk up to the counter, order a hamburger, order a milkshake, order a fries. They're all American meal, as they called it. And get out of there in 15 seconds. That was totally new. By 1952, from this little hamburger stand, these guys were doing $350,000 in, in revenue a year. That was unheard of. As word spread about this new speedy system, San Bernardino, California became a mecca for restaurant owners looking to increase speed of service. Everybody was going to San Bernardino in the food service industry to figure out what these brothers had done and they all started to copy it. Glenn G. Bell Jr., a San Bernardino native who patronized McDonald's regularly, applied the speedy service system to a Mexican food menu. His restaurant chain would later be named Taco Bell. In 1953, Keith G. Kramer visited the McDonald Brothers restaurant, then returned home to Daytona Beach, Florida. The restaurant he opened, Instaburger, would later become Burger King. A year later, a milkshake mixer salesman named Ray Kroc visited the McDonald Brothers restaurant to find out why such a small operation was ordering so many of his multi-mixers. Upon seeing the speedy service system in action, Kroc realized he had walked into a gold mine. He persuaded the McDonald Brothers to sign a contract 
giving him the sole rights to franchise their operation across the country. The brothers would receive 0.5% of all sales. On April 15, 1955, Kroc opened the first McDonald's franchise in Des Plaines, Illinois. Five years later, there were 200 McDonald's restaurants. By the late 60s, the fast food industry was a multi-billion dollar giant. McDonald's, Burger King, Jack in the Box, Carl's Jr., KFC, and many others were battling for America's fast food dollars. Training academies such as McDonald's Hamburger University schooled managers and crews in the art and science of fast food. McDonald's was started in 1975 in Sierra Vista, Arizona. One of our franchisees there saw that he had a huge opportunity in being able to serve the military folks there because they were unable to come into his restaurant in uniform. So what he did in order to capitalize on that opportunity, he blew a wall out of his uh, building and made it the first drive through in the McDonald's uh, system. That same year, Burger King offered drive through service. And from that moment on, the Battle of the Windows was joined. It totally surprised them. Within 10 years, virtually all of McDonald's restaurants had drive through windows. The demand for drive through service challenged the fast food industry to rethink and retool its operations from the ground up. Ready Access Pass Through Window Systems of West Chicago, Illinois, was one of the first manufacturers of drive through windows. We went to our first uh, convention in 1979. We took the uh, window to market, and people would come by and say, well, what is that for? And we tell them, it's a drive-through window. 
and they'd look at me and say, it must be a miniature model because how can you drive a car through that? You know, so that was in 1979 and hardly anybody knew what drive through was. The first windows were simple sliding panes set in aluminum frames. They were usually constructed by glazing contractors. Then, actual drive through window makers like Ready Access and QuickServe Incorporated got into the act. Windows would be developed to accommodate just about any form of fast food. But in the early days, the operators discovered that the most difficult item to move through a window system was information. Uh, well, my family opened uh, one of the first drive throughs in the area in 1977. And at that time, the technology was pretty primitive. It was actually just a, a, a regular speaker that actually was positioned in the drive through booth. And the person working in drive through had to physically stand in front of the speaker to listen to what the customer was ordering at the drive through menu board. Once the information got inside the restaurant, a whole new set of challenges arose. In the early days, we were writing things down on menu pads. Initially, it was a blank piece of paper, and then at one point, we moved to having all of the menu items written on that pad, and we could just jot down how many of each item, and then physically add it up. Beyond the challenges of technical hardware that delivered the fast, the industry had to develop a pipeline to deliver the food. Throughout the 80s, the burger giants set about designing a network of suppliers that could deliver millions of tons of food to thousands of restaurants at exacting standards of uniformity. And do it with speed. It was invented by McDonald's, working with its suppliers and its vendors. And when McDonald's wants to do something, they call a vendor up, and uh, guess what? They've got 50 guys who would love to meet that need. Exacting specifications were sent out to meat packers, bakers, farmers, and condiment makers. The message was clear. If you want to sell to us, you have to make it our way. Of all the products that passed through the drive through window, no single product was heaped with such lavish technical and scientific attention as the French fried potato. It was the perfect car-friendly eat-while-you-drive food. Americans consume an average of 30 pounds of fries per capita each year for a total of approximately 4 million annual tons. Hence, every phase of French fry production is monitored from soil to seasoning. Companies like J.R. Simplot and Lamb Weston in Idaho figured out how to deliver fries the way fast food giants wanted them. They built mammoth French fry factories that could turn out a million pounds of fries a day. Mountain ranges of whole potatoes are washed and sorted and sorted again. Their skins are blasted off in kettles of pressurized steam. The spuds are then fired through a device called a water gun knife, where a lattice of carbon steel blades sections them into fries of uniform thickness. Further downstream, another set of cutters uses laser beams to ensure a perfect eat-while-you-drive length. After several more layers of inspection, the fries are blanched and partially fried, then bagged and fast frozen for their trip to a restaurant near you. And as the speed of life moved ever faster, that restaurant was moving more and more mountains of burgers, fries, and drinks through the hole in the wall. I'm fine, how are you? Next, we'll see how advanced technology took the drive through to the next level of speed and accuracy. The average American eats approximately 120 burgers per year. drive through will return on Modern Marvels. Ready Access Pass-Through Window Systems makes drive through windows for most of the major fast food chains. In their West Chicago plant, they turn out almost 4,000 windows per year. They're designed to withstand a lifetime of abuse. Doors open 30, 40 times in a building, and then the drive through probably open 2,000 times a day. You know, it's just opening and closing. And so we have to build a product that's going to withstand, and because everyone operates the window a little differently. Raw materials are distributed to the various assembly lines.
Each window is assembled by hand using the latest in technology and materials, including some from the aircraft industry. What we tried to do over here was to try to come up with uh, parts and pieces in the window that we wouldn't have to replace. Like on a 275, we don't just use regular rollers. We use stainless steel aircraft rollers so they won't freeze or bind up in the wintertime. Seven years, we've never replaced the roller. The windows range in complexity from manual to semi-automatic to fully automatic. Once the frame is completed, the glass panes are fitted to the track mechanism. The final operation is testing. On our electric windows, we run 48-hour tests to make sure the boards burn, everything is in sync and running the right way. So if something happens, there's a malfunction, we want to get it to happen in the plant, not any place else. Today's drive-through window is the last stop in a high-tech communication and delivery system. We kind of break the drive-through down into to three separate areas. Um, let me order um, a Happy Meal cheeseburger. The ordering points, which is at the menu board, the pay window or cashier window, and then the present window where you actually pick up the food and drive away. The early drive-through squawk box speaker systems were like talking through tin cans and string. Today's menu board microphones are cushioned by foam insulation and have been specially designed to filter out highs and lows and hone in on the decibel range of the human voice. Thank you. Okay, is there going to be anything else for you? Order confirmation boards help ensure order accuracy. We have perfect communication with our customer. We can hear them very clearly as they place the order, making it easier for us to serve them accurately and uh, quickly as well. Uh, the crew people are wearing headsets and they have belt packs where they can hear the customer ordering. The advantage of that is that they can begin to speak to the customer and take their order and initiate it without actually physically standing in drive through Computer screens flash the order to multiple stations inside the restaurant. The orders come up on those screens right there, and each screen is represented on one side of uh, the preparation line. So before the customer is really finished ordering, most of the items are already prepared and moving down the line. This double lane drive through allows for twice the volume at peak hours. Lane traffic is monitored by television cameras. Order taking time is the longest time in the entire process. And what we do here is we're able to order two different orders at a time. The order board on the far side we call the primary side and this is the secondary side. Once we have two or three cars waiting to order, they can come and order on either side and you don't have that long wait to order. But even the best ordering system can sometimes benefit from a little low-tech innovation. We put these little stickers right up here on the screen that shows the cars in the drive through and we ask the order taker not to store the order until the car crosses this blue sticker tape. So even though we have all this great technology, you know, the technology works wonderful, but it works better when you don't store the order till after you pass this point right here. It all sounds great, Reggie, but is it fast? Man, it's blazing fast. It, it is really fast, it really is. This is the fastest drive through ever conceived by man. While Windows continued to rule, one company was teaching the old drive-in dog some new high-tech tricks. Its rapid rise in the market had been called by some the sonic boom. Sonic started out as the top hat drive-in during the 1950s. Rather than abandon the car hop concept, Sonic sought to streamline the process, using the same high-tech tools as the other fast food chains. I think people have a misconception about drive-ins, that it's slower than a drive through lane, and actually, at least at Sonic, that's it's quite the contrary. Our average ticket time is about four minutes or less. And the beauty of a driving concept that I think has so much appeal is that the customer is the person that's empowered in a drive-in 
concept because you have your own menu, you don't have anybody sitting behind you impatiently waiting for you to decide what it is you want to eat. These high-tech car hops don't do any hopping onto running boards. The use of these headsets, that allows us to actually, while the car hops on the lot, say, good afternoon, welcome to Sonic, may I take your order? And so the customer knows we've heard them, we're responding to them, and that we will prepare their order. As competition increased, fast food chains continued to look for more speed. They searched for ways to control and manipulate every phase of the drive through process and to identify the slow spots. Phase research timer systems of Santa Ana, California provided computerized timing tools that could break down the process to its smallest increments. The old saying goes, in order to manage something, you have to measure it. And um, hence the interest arose in the early days in somehow having a reliable, representative, accurate way of measuring the times for the cars as they were going through. Doing it for every car, all day long, every day of the week, every week of the year. As technology improved, these time measuring devices became more and more sophisticated. How much time at the cash transaction? How much to pick up? How long at the menu board? How long was it taking to greet the customer when they first arrived at the menu board before someone asked them, may I take your order? One of the problems they found was the same old bottleneck that had plagued the gas stations and toll roads. Because coins are involved, uh, getting a wallet out, finding a purse, finding the right change, making the right change inside of the store for the customer, possibly changing a fifty or hundred dollar bill, the slowdown that may occur when somebody gets change and they drop it in their lap. Think tank gurus and efficiency experts rack their brains for a solution to the pay window problem. But in the end, the answer came from the trenches. Actually, the light bulb for uh, transponder te technology came home as I was uh, driving home from one of these McDonald's drive through meetings one day. I drove on the tollway, and it just came to mind that, gee, wouldn't it be cool if you could use the same technology at McDonald's that I'm using on the tollway? Why not? Once again, it was RFID to the rescue. Although the new transponder technology is still being tested by McDonald's and other fast food chains, the early results are very promising. Our, our fast track, we get about 500 or so cars a day, so you'll get it quite a bit. How would this be on your fast track today? This is the device that actually is placed in the customer's window in their car. When the customer drives into the drive through lane, there's what we call a reader board above the drive through lane that picks up this radio frequency. So we ask, would you like to put that on your transponder today? I would it be on your fast track today? Yes, it will, please. Oh. If they say yes, then the, they simply verify the total on the customer order display with the total on their order pad. Is the total the same on both screens? Yes, it is. They say yes, they simply go to the pickup window and take their food away. Taking the food away is just what we've been doing for the last 25 years. In this short span of time, the drive through window has gone from a promotional experiment to a quarter trillion dollar business and an icon of our culture. Next, we'll roll down our window on some other industries that are selling more than just burgers and fries. In 1994, McDonald's opened its first restaurant in Kuwait City, Kuwait. On opening day, the drive through line was seven miles long. drive through will return on Modern Marvels. Although fast food may have made the most noise and money, it wasn't the only player in the drive through revolution. A diverse and sometimes unlikely assortment of industries had been catering to car-bound customers as far back is the 1930s. In 1932, the first drive-in movie theater opened in Camden, New Jersey. Now drivers could watch a talkie while eating in their cars. One spiritual spin-off of this was the drive-in church, 
where car-bound congregations could worship from behind the wheel. Cleanliness followed godliness with the advent of the drive through car wash and the drive through laundry. As more and more industries attempted to exploit this window of opportunity, a formula began to emerge. drive through works wherever you, you have something where the customer wants to do it fast and the vendor is currently doing it slowly. One industry that fit this definition was banking. In the late 1950s, banks began to offer drive through service using dedicated tellers inside drive-up booths. In the 1960s, they began to replace the humans with robot tellers, called ATMs, automated teller machines. The first full-function ATM was uh, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, it was a dock and tell machine that was installed in 1968. Where did they install it? In a branch. It made no sense. And they didn't even install it outside the branch. You had to walk in the bank for security reasons. But by the mid-70s, late-70s, you started to get machines that were built, and they were perfect for a drive through Everything was positioned so the driver could work everything without getting out of the car. One institution not usually associated with speed got into the act in Las Vegas, Nevada. At the Little White Wedding Chapel, Charlotte Richards, the high priestess of drive through matrimony, has been performing these services for backseat brides and grooms for over 35 years. The inspiration for the drive through wedding was that I saw so many people that were handicapped and I thought, what a way, nice way for them to come and that, that way they don't have to spend a lot of pain getting in and out of their vehicles and so on. Not all drive throughs are about making money. drive through flu shot clinics and voter registration stops offer car convenient community services. Today, drive throughs are catering to a wider range of human needs than ever before, including death and taxes. Some communities are now trying to prohibit new construction of drive throughs citing problems of traffic, noise, and pollution. But have we come too far to go back now? I know there's a lot of uh, city fathers that would like to eliminate drive through because it's a hassle, it's a traffic hassle. I think drive throughs here to stay. Ironically, the company that opened the first drive through window, the Texas Pig Stand, has returned to a slower pace. We're a full-service restaurant now, and we, um, we emphasize customer service and knowing our customer. We have employees that have been with us many years, and that creates a family kind of atmosphere. When a person comes in, we know them by name, and we know that they don't want cream in their coffee. And Joe's uh, usually here at 10 o'clock, but he's late today. I wonder, I wonder if he's okay. You know, this is what we're about. But in spite of Richard Haley's noble retro vision, the fast lane is here to stay. It is up to us to choose the speed at which we will live. So tonight, what do you say? We leave the car in the garage, open a nice bottle of wine, and sit down to a nice home-cooked dinner slowly savoring the good things in life. Are you kidding? Who has time for that? I'll just grab a burger on the way to pick up my laundry, get gas, get the bank, get a flu shot, register to vote stuff, car wash, ooh, get married, get stamps, grab a coffee, pay my tax, pay, pay my respects, do my recycling, go to confession, pick up the numbers, get the plan, 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 get